Welcome to another episode of Video Store Rejects. This is a podcast where we discuss directors' filmographies and our favorite film franchises. I'm your host, Cody House. I have a returning guest. He has bravely taken a bullet, as some people would say, because we are covering two Coen Brother movies today, and by many, these are considered their two worst films. That's Intolerable Cruelty and The Lady Killers. Welcome back, Justin, and thank you for bravely deciding to watch these movies and talk about them with me. Yeah, of course. Yeah, thanks for letting me back on the show. Um, yeah, I like to do, because I'm not a big uh, director's guy, but I like to do this. Um, well, yeah, you know, we're friends too, so I like to come on and, and chat movies with you. But uh, yeah, this I've seen all of their movies except for Blood, uh, Hudsucker Proxy and Blood Simple now. Um, but yeah, add these two onto the, uh, the list. Wow. And and it's crazy that they came back to back mm-hmm. and right before their movie that made them like more mainstream because they won awards for no country for old men after after lady killers so. right like after after lady killers they i don't know if it makes them more mainstream with no country but it definitely makes them like anointed directors that like critic well they were already critical darlings but like with winning the oscar now everyone thinks everything they direct is going to have some sort of oscar buzz right they've become those directors oh well is this one gonna get award nominations yeah uh and i wonder if they're like well compared to intolerable cruelty and the lady killers no country for old men is their masterpiece right i mean it's it, because off the heels of these two movies you wouldn't even know you know that the, it's the same directors well i have an interesting theory and upon reading about the making of these movies i think i can see why these are regarded as lesser cohen's so you've seen all their movies now but two right yep Blood Simple and Hudsucker Prize. Do you think there is something missing from these two movies that's usually in most of the other Coen Brothers films? Uh, y- y- yeah, I mean, uh, well, for the first thing that comes to mind is cinematography. I mean, Roger what? Deakins did, did both of these movies, but... It, it's there's these movies are formulaic both of them i mean there's there's stuff that we've definitely seen before i mean intolerable cruelty is a is supposed to be a rom-com right mm-hmm. and and in any of their filmography here romance isn't one of the things that's at the forefront i mean there's a little bit in raising arizona that's a little bit of a romance in a way sure yeah but it's mostly about being a parent yeah about wanting to be a mom and yeah so uh i mean there's always relationships but it's never the focal point has never been about trying to get two people together to fall in love ever and so yeah that's why with intolerable cruelty it was like well i guess now they've done all genres pretty much they've pretty much covered covered every every genre i think i think really the only thing they haven't tackled as like a sci-fi or a fantasy uh yeah um or <clears throat> a war movie yeah they haven't done well i guess that's not technically a war movie but they did write the script for bridge of spies which i guess oh, is right. more which is kind of an espionage movie but more it's like a drama about constitutional law mm-hmm. i like bridge of spies I do too. And I think I think the writing is one of the things that made it elevate, and, and of course, Mark, Mark Rylance. I mean, of course, amazing. Um, so I think because it is baffling that you can't tell that Roger Deakins shot either one of these movies. I was gonna say almost their personality is nowhere in either one of these movies. Right. Yeah. Which yeah. Is weird I mean, for these directors because that's one of the thing that makes them stand out as directors is their 
personality like it melds into whatever genre they're doing yeah and and they're big on having characters like in the lady killers they're all characters and intolerable cruelty they're just normal people there's not there's not a character at you know uh um because in, in every single just we'll take big lebowski the dude that's a character that's that's iconic right uh and the lady killers it seems like that's what he was going for is he wanted tom hanks to become this iconic character uh but all he was was just foghorn leghorn you know yeah uh, and and which i loved as a kid so it was it was fun to hear him but it was a little I, normally tom hanks you don't see him acting but i saw him acting in this movie you know i do think he was having fun but um maybe miscast right yeah i i guess we can jump around um but yeah, it definitely feels like Tom Hanks is trying, as you said, like, I guess is what you mean by acting. Like, you can tell, like, he's, like, mm, he's overacting, like, and usually he's a little more naturalistic, generally, as a performer. But yeah, this is pure Foghorn Leghorn, and it does seem miscast. Like, I know Tom Hanks has played not so nice or good people, but this is kind of maybe a little too much for Tom Hanks. Like it's like, there's just usually he's charming. So it's a little hard to buy him as this like completely evil person, even though it's a cartoonish character. Yeah. And even like his intentions, like, um, so the movie is about uh, uh, a group of people who, who want to, to steal from a, a casino boat, right? And um, the way that they do that is by, by uh, going underground, going underneath it. And the best way that they found out that they could do that is by this lady, she lives in a house and she, you dig underneath from her house, you know, out and you'll eventually get to the water and to the boat. So um, he uh, pays to live there and he, tells her that they're going to be uh, doing music down in the basement, uh, you know, gospel style music in the basement. And um, she loves that. So she, of course, she, you know, invites him in and, and uh, that's when things start to go down. The thing with this movie is, is that nothing happened. Nothing happens for like the first it's it's short which is good both of these movies are short which is great uh but nothing happens for like the first hour pretty much i'm you know it's it's us meeting the characters i really the way that they introduced the characters just by popping around and jumping around i just thought it was so distracting because it's like okay well who's this who's this who's this instead of like maybe showing us the entire group and then giving us a little bit of a backstory of them and, and why they are, you know, who they are. But at first I was confused, you know, I, I know that these actors are in the movie because of the credits, the pre-credits, but, uh, um, but uh, uh, yeah, I just thought the way that they just threw in snippets of each one of them, it just was distracting and, and kind of like all over the place. I feel like with the Coen brothers, they have a, a certain, you know, view and with the lady killers i think they jumped around a little bit so what's interesting about both of these projects especially intolerable cruelty is that was a project that they did not develop on their own they were basically brought in as script doctors for that and then ended up directing and they were not supposed to direct the lady killers either they were just kind of brought on to work on the script actually barry sonnenfeld was supposed to direct the lady killers and this is a remake of a british comedy with mm -hmm. uh alec guinness and peter sellers i've never seen it the plot is a little similar i don't think it's a casino they're trying to rob in the original though but i could be wrong but basically the same setup a group of thieves pretend to be musicians and use this use the landlady's house to um, use their base of operation. But like really in the lady killers, the only thing that feels like a Coen brothers movie to me is like 
near the end of like what happens to all these guys after they've committed the crime. Like that's the only thing that feels like Cohen brother as to me is like how these guys all get wiped out by their own stupidity. And to me, that was the most fun. Uh, I had the most fun on the bridge with them, you know, uh, cause that's where they would dispose the, of the dirt. They'd go on the bridge and they'd, you know, jump it down, uh, drop it down and onto this barge, this moving barge uh, that were full of trash, you know, because uh, they live in Mississippi. And I like the way that it opened, showing us that there is sort of this trash island that uh, <laughs> that all this trash goes to. And it does come back into play. And I thought that that, that worked out really well. Um, but I had the most fun on on top of that bridge. And I mean, the last one you can kind of see coming, but for, for the most part, it was uh, accidental the way that these guys went down. And it actually, in Intolerable Cruelty, a similar thing happened. Yeah, so, so in that movie, it was originally, I don't know if you noticed, but the producer was Brian Grazer, who is yeah. Ron Howard's producing partner. Yeah, this was originally supposed to be Ron Howard, and then event Jonathan Demi was involved at one point too. And it was going to be a Julia Roberts vehicle at one point. It Richard Gere was cast in the role, and then it was Hugh Grant, and then even Will Smith at some point. They tried to get Will Smith in this, so I will say this one. This one. I don't know if it's worse than the lady killers or just a bigger disappointment because you've got two great leads, right? These are like two of the, two of the most beautiful people in Hollywood and they actually have chemistry on screen chemistry together. And like the movie's just flat, like the movie's not helping them. And I know it's trying to be like a Spencer Tracy, Catherine Hepburn type of romantic comedy from, that era and the dialogue has those whippy back and forth, but like something's missing. And I don't know if it's the script or if the Coens weren't feeling it because they were involved in a project with Brad Pitt that didn't come through. They almost retired or quit from directing and they took this project on at first as script doctors and then ended up directing it. But like the only thing that feels Cohen's Cohen's to me in this is like the old man that runs the law firm with all the coloscopy bags and the hitman with asthma. Like that's the only thing that feels like the Cohen yeah. brothers directed it. And a lot of dialogue. You can tell that it's, you know. But when you, how can you be a script doctor and then this is still what comes out? Like what how bad was it? You know? Uh, and you, I mean, a hundred percent true. Both of these, I mean, Catherine Zeta Jones in this movie is gorgeous. I'm just believably gorgeous in this movie. And yeah, all the girls love George Clooney this time. I mean, there's, there's not bigger names in 2003 than George Clooney and Catherine Zeta Jones. So, you know, with Entrapment, with Ocean's Eleven, I mean, just everyone was like, mm -hmm. so this should work perfectly. This should be awesome. But I may be standing alone here. I thought George Clooney, this is the worst I've seen him. I mean, the worst I've ever seen him. I, don't, I, I just was so not interested in him or his storyline uh, at all. And you're kind of, uh, she's going through a divorce and you're, you're trying to uh, jump at that vulnerability during, it's like the wrong time. I mean, it's, it's very what a man would do, you know? <laughs> so, uh, I just didn't, I just didn't appreciate that much. I, but I, but you're right. They, they have great chemistry. I mean, they, there's a lot of, yeah, like sexual tension going on, but it was just, um, yeah, like he just jumped at her at the wrong time. Uh, there is a lot of like this going around, like what is really happening? What's not happening? And then also, so Catherine Zeta-Jones is kind of like the mastermind behind all this. Why? Why? What is she, what, why? What is going on? 
you know why did she want to go through all this and you know there's a lot of men along the way that she had to kind of step on to get to this point like but but why do you think why why what was her motive you know so she obviously wanted to get the money from her husband that sets up the movie right and Ed, Ed, edward herman or whatever his name was the guy from gilmore girls you know catching him with the affair but then of course george clooney who's supposed to be the best divorce lawyer in town even though he's kind of an idiot because that's when the cohen's cast george clooney they want him to play an idiot because they talk about him playing a numb skull yeah so then i think it becomes a revenge plot towards him because you know he he got her out of the money she was going to get because he like found that loop, loophole of purposely that she purposely only married him to get his money. Mm -hmm. And so then there comes the whole ruse with the Billy Bob character. Who but now, but, but at that point, who is she trying to get at? George? Yeah. It's a long okay. ruse to get to George because she knows he's attracted to her. Yeah, but but why <laughs> so all she cares about is the money and I, I mean there's just so many other ways that she can do it and I just feel like uh, you know manipulating men is not a good way to do it I think this would have been better if they were both lawyers and they were both kind of like one was they were on opposite sides and then they kind of do that classic can't stand each other at first, but then like they find out like they're actually perfect for each other type of trope. I think that would have worked because I don't really like them portraying Catherine Zeta Jones as like this man eater type of, you know, manipulative user character that she is. Yeah, I didn't like that either. Um, but they did actually, not the Coens, but a movie came out a year later in 2004 starring Pierce Brosnan and Julianne Moore called Laws of Attraction. And that was two lawyers. And same, wasn't same that as, not good? I don't remember that being a good movie. I didn't no. see it. But I don't remember Eight, people saying 18% it. 18% on Rotten Tomatoes. Yeah. <laughs> this might be why um, romantic comedies kind of died as a genre. Well, yeah, probably. But it, like this one, what, did you find it funny? No. That's actually, not, and that's weird coming from the Coens, who are so good nothing. at dialogue and characters. Like this isn't funny. Like this should, this should have been a slam dunk. <laughs> exactly. That's what I'm trying to say. George Clooney, Catherine Zeta Jones, Cohen Brothers. I mean Jeffrey Rush. You know, like it could have been awesome. It could have been so so good, and it just it was so flat. They're, the only thing that kept us moving was the chemistry and you know obviously where is it gonna go because i really didn't know where it was going to go you know when uh when we met billy bob and um at that party and whatnot it was just like okay what is going on and plus nobody recognized him he's an actor not right. one person there recognized him like, I know not a lot of people watch soap operas, but there had to be somebody that either watched the soap opera or knows somebody that watches the soap opera. Yeah. Like, which there's another connection with these two movies besides them not being great and them being directed by the Coens. Bruce Campbell has a cameo in both <laughs> movies, and I don't think he speaks in either movie. Does he say well, anything in the the tv scene with him and billy bob as the doctors uh no i don't think so but what, what did he do in lady killers he was the humane society or the dog person that's standing there on set when jk simmons kills the dog oh right yeah 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 that's so funny. <laughs> yeah Which i will okay. say I, I do like jk simmons he might be the only actor i like in the movie yeah but wasn't that so weird that we went from Tom Hanks in The Lady in the House to jump to a set 
and it's J.K. Simmons, you know, trying to make a dog uh, wear a, a f- gas mask. You know, he really wants it authentic, uh, or at least the director does. But um, it was just, and then I was like, well, what? What? This is what is going on? And it it has nothing to do with the rest of the movie. It doesn't come into play at all. So when we meet when we meet Gawain, who's Marlon Brand or Marlon uh, Wayne's. We, we that play that pays off. It's at the he works at the casino. I just felt they were all over the place in the League Killers for sure. Yeah, I will. I will give intolerable cruelty. This it it it's flat. It doesn't completely work, but at least there's a little bit of structure still there. Like you can you can kind of see where it goes from point A to B to C. Lady Killers is a mess. It is an absolute mess of a movie and it doesn't it doesn't even really flow well. Like there's just like jumbled scenes put together and like I know like the comedy with the older lady that owns the house is supposed to is supposed to be the character that we side with, but she's not exactly a nice person either. She's just like that mean grandma character, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, we have zero backstory from her. So why do, why should we care about her? You know, just because, um, I mean, in theory, if it all worked out, she would have been known the wiser, right? She would have had no clue. So it, nobody was going to get hurt in any situation but it's just like she was she was just there to put up speed bumps you know because it's, if she came downstairs then they had to crawl out of the tunnel close it and pretend they're playing music uh you know so it was she was just there for speed bumps and it just in an already jump jumping around movie it's like well, we don't we don't really even need this we need we need more of a, a of a thrill like um we need to be kind of scared for them a little bit and we just never work because if they got caught it's like oh no no big deal you know um yeah just just really all over the place and again if they did they come on this one to be doctors script doctors as well i believe so i believe they came on to help work on the script and then, for whatever reason, whoever was going to originally direct this, Barry Sonnenfeld, didn't do it. So it's kind of weird because we know they're gifted writers, but it I can't, I can barely tell they directed these movies. Exactly. Like, it exactly. feels like they just needed a job or needed something to do, and they made these movies. And most of these actors agreed to be in these movies because it was the Coen brothers. Like, I'm sure Tom Hanks was Absolutely. like, sure, I'll work with the Coen brothers and do an over-the-top villainous role. But, yeah. And, like, these movies are terrible. They're just aggressively mediocre. And that that is kind of sad coming from filmmakers who almost have an untouchable filmography. Yeah, I mean, both were successful in theaters. Um, Intolerable Cruelty had a budget of 60 million and a box office was 120. Um, Lady wow. Killers not as much. Yeah. I didn't well, realize it did that well. The names, it's it's George Clooney and Catherine Zeta-Jones. I mean, everyone wanted to see them together, you know? Uh, and then Lady Killers not as well. Uh, 35 million and in box office 76.7 so it may have made a little bit of money after doing all the the marketing for it but uh, i mean the coen brothers aren't necessarily uh directors that make a lot of money in the box office no they're um, not they, but they typically don't make big budget movies so it's okay. right yeah like yeah, I, and I'm, I'm pretty sure True Grit is the only movie they directed that has made over a hundred million dollars. Well, yeah, besides well, worldwide, Cruelty. I guess Intolerable Cruelty did. Yeah, um, yeah, they're they're definitely not. Uh, let's see how much True Grit made here. Uh, Two hundred fifty-two point three million. So yeah, that's got to uh, be their highest-grossing movie. 
because even in no country is 171.6. So yeah, I do think True Grit was one of the bigger ones. Um, yeah, Inside Llewyn Davis only 33 million. Uh, so were any of these movies nominated for anything? These two, I don't think so. I don't remember any kind of talk for them. Um. I do know that overall at the time Intolerable Cruelty got mostly good reviews, but I do still think it's still regarded as one of their weaker films. And Lady Killers did not get good reviews when it came out. And I haven't heard anybody like defend this movie like, oh, it's actually pretty good. Like, Well, nobody even talks about these two movies. If you were to say to somebody who's who just doesn't know filmographies uh, from anybody, and you were to say um, you, that the Coen Brothers did, you, did the Intolerable Cruelty, you'd be like, no, no way. Like I bet money against that. There's no way that they did that movie. You know, just just by the way that the poster looks, <laughs> just by the way that the movie is itself. I mean, the, there's just no way it looks like coen brothers movie and then same thing with the lady killers like it's it just it, it's it, it almost looks like it's supposed to be a comedy poster you know um and and it should be a, a comedy but did you did you find any fun funny stuff in there you know uh z ma who did the cigarette thing that was pretty cool I mean, yeah, his, his little uh, his little fight with the guys that try to rob the donut shop is pretty cool. Yeah, he just, <laughs> just up the nostril. <laughs> but no, I did not find this movie funny at all. I didn't think it was funny when I watched it when it when we when I, my dad rented it a long time ago, and rewatching it the other day, I'm like, this should be funny. This should be a funny movie and like nothing is working. Like it is, it's just, it's just there. Yeah. Like, um, like Marlon Wayne's character could have been great. The, the guy who plays, um, Duke or whatever his name is, uh, the, the, the football player. Yeah. I, I mean, it's just like over the top, right? Like, but not in a I mean, good the, way. Like it was no, just... not in a good way. No, it was he was supposed to come off as like really, really dumb, gets beaten up, you know, lots of concussions. He always had his mouth hanging open, you know, like it just just way over the time. You don't there's no there's no human like that, you know, unless they're being treated for something. So if they were gonna go cartoony, they should have went full cartoony and like just really like this should have been more like raising arizona and i feel like this is the cohen's doing a hollywood movie both of these and it not working because they're trying to make like what they think a successful hollywood comedy would be yeah yeah i mean with the lady killers i see i see what they were going with by casting tom hanks because you know he's he's america's favorite uncle and so you can't yeah yeah he's in this uh villainous role but you also want to like him that's what i think they were going for but it that didn't work like i didn't care for him i love the actor i just didn't care for his character at all uh, any of them just like i said before it's like you there's nothing for us to latch on to and like grasp on to and and you know I mean, if if there was nobody alive in the end of this movie, including Cedric the Entertainer, or, you know, I mean, oh, that's from the other movie, but including um, uh, the cop, uh, yeah, the sheriff, you know, like if it died, it'd be like, oh, okay, bleh. yeah, it's like, yeah, but like you don't even care. They could all die, and you're like, ah, bleh, okay, because it's just it just didn't work um, at all. I, I just think the whole it was just a huge miscast for sure for for lady killers. And I mean even the lady, the why why her? You know? You could have gotten somebody like of a name that's a similar, 
you know, like an Octavia Spencer. I mean, I know in 2004, she wasn't old, but like that sort of, you know, somebody who can carry a movie like that because she's the main character. Mm -hmm. Well, she's just playing a caricature as well, just like almost every other character. They're like all these different characters and they try to put them all together and it just doesn't work. Mm -hmm. I will say I did i didn't really laugh but i did kind of chuckle every once in a while when like the portrait of her dead husband would get moved and it looked like it was reacting to like what was going on yeah yeah like that the, was interesting that kind of felt i mean i don't know it, it was it, i mean it was goofy it's it's a cartoon like that would happen in a cartoon. But so this they, needed to they, be like 10 times more a cartoon for it to work. And like, it's maybe, just, maybe even animated. Maybe. But if they had shot this like they shot Raising Arizona, this might have been slightly at least interesting instead of just boring. Was Roger Deakins the. Uh, no, Barry Sonnenfeld was the cinematographer for Raising Arizona. So yeah, the I Roger Deakins is an award-winning cinematographer, and these are just like static shots. Not nothing, nothing is is unique, or I, I mean, it's flat. It's just all flat. I mean, we're looking down. We're looking from the top of the stairs down at them. We're looking from down up to the top of the stairs. You know, and we're in the center of the circle of these guys talking. I mean, it was just. It's so simple and like, it's like a um, a college student, you know, would have done it because it's just it's by the book. It's what you're taught. You know, uh, get the wide, get the medium, get the close, and it's just. It just you can see that happening, especially in uh, the Lady Killers, for sure. Um, yeah, like with the crow up here, you're like looking up down there. And it's like, OK, I mean, we've seen this before. Like, give us something else. Um, yeah, so I wonder if their, with their them, hearts you know? just weren't in this or maybe they have to like fully craft the story from beginning to end. Like they can't come in and come in and help that something that's already in development because obviously not, because these are like, even if you don't like all of their other movies, you can't accuse them of being boring. Like there is something sure. interesting going on in all their other movies. Uh, no country for old men's world. A little boring. A little boring. But okay. It's a little even, boring. <laughs> even though Javier Bardem is like terrifying in the movie. Yeah, but uh, Josh Brolin. You want to know um, a funny story about how he got that part? Josh? Yeah. Oh, yeah, let me hear. It. Uh, so he decided to audition for the role while he was making Planet Terror with Robert Rodriguez. So he got Tarantino to direct him and Rodriguez to shoot his audition video. And the Coens are watching it and they're like, who shot this video? This looks really good. <laughs> I mean, for an audition to have a known director and well, two known directors and one be a great cinematographer as well for an audition and you don't get it. It must be the acting, right? So <laughs> unbelievable. I've never heard that before. That's Yeah. I'm wow. I wanna see it. I kinda wanna see it now. Cause like this is this is my wall when I do my audition. So you're this is how this is you know, I'm sure they were like actually in the desert or, you know, went somewhere where the West won. <laughs> I mean, for an audition, that's it had a budget of ten thousand dollars. That's insane. <laughs> so, and I think that maybe because they were trying to adapt this novel called "To the Sea," I think is what it was called. It was a project they were going to do with Brad Pitt and financing and everything. It just didn't happen. 
Maybe they just were like, I got to work or we're never going to work again. So, yeah, I I guess, yeah, Cohen's don't don't do something that you're not fully involved in from the beginning, I guess, because it feels like they're on autopilot. Like they just set up shot shots and we're like, OK, yeah, that works. Yeah, there's um, the old saying that one for me, one for you. Martin Scorsese does one for himself and one for the studio. I think this is kind of where they were lying, you know, because uh, Intolerable Cruelty is actually a Universal Pictures movie and they haven't even really done anything with them except uh, Oh Brother, We're Out Thou, you know, because Buena Vista and, and Universal always team up together. Um, but uh, yeah, so solely Universal, that was interesting. Um, so I think they did do it for that sort of main because Universal to me is is a it, it, it it's Fast and the Furious right it just it's franchises there's you know movies they're you know they're they're mostly like blockbuster they're not necessarily ones that are um, you know award winners usually um, so I think that they just went with this yeah like a studio and they were like hey we're gonna uh, option this for you and yeah they took they took the money but again what's the money like how a million dollars each on a 35 million dollar movie right let's just say uh, uh, tom hanks has to get a bunch of that right and <laughs> same with same with uh, intolerable cruelty like it's uh 60 million dollars i'm sure like a third of that went to zeta and george right so yeah, because this know. would be the peak of their their movie star period, you know. Uh, and the man who wasn't there was the one that you guys did before this. Yes. How was that uh, received in and in, uh, in comparison? Because so what? Because here's what I see: is I see Fargo, Big Lebowski, Oh Brother, Where Art Thou, the man who wasn't there. And then Intolerable Cruelty is Lady Killer and then No Country for Old Men. So you have a slew of great films and then it sort of seems like it starts to trickle out, right? And then bam, they're Oscar, which is three years later after Lady Killers. So do you think leading up to it with these great movies and then having the one at the after these sh shit movies like the bookend, do you think it just it's because those ones before were so damn good or they're just shit movies these two um yeah i mean it certainly doesn't help these movies that their body of work up to this is arguably great to really good for the most part even even hudsucker proxy which at the time people i think it got mixed reviews and people were saying it wasn't the best cohen's it's really good. It's a masterpiece compared to these two movies. So I think that doesn't help. I think these movies, I think Intolerable Cruelty is fine. Like, we may have given it higher praise or not, maybe not higher praise, but probably not be as hard on it if it was from a director whose body of work wasn't like the Coens. We'd probably be like, ah, it's okay, it's fine, you know. I think Lady Killers, though, is... Yeah, you said Ron... Like, Ron Howard was supposed to be the director or whatever. Like, that makes sense. Yeah, this, that makes this sense. feels like something... Not that Ron Howard's a bad director, but... You know, he's he's his body of work is a little more... You know, back and forth compared to what the Coen's reputation is, right? Like, if mm -hmm. Ron Howard made a movie that's fine, no one's going to be upset. And it's like, well, it happens there once in a while, whatever the script, the project. I think Lady Killers is just a messy movie. Probably wouldn't matter who directed it. I think that one is a stinker. Yeah, it is. It's it's definitely the worst out of the two. And you, I watched uh, Intolerable Cruelty with my girlfriend, and afterwards I was like, "Oh, that was pretty bad." And she's like, "I liked it." So you know, she she got what the the, the they were trying to do with this rom com. You know, I I saw what they were doing, and it just didn't latch on to me the way that it should. I think know, the pieces are there, but 
for whatever reason, and it's probably partly because of the project they were passionate about making didn't happen. I, I think they just weren't in it. And so you can't tell like their presence or personality as directors are there. Yeah. And the movie suffers for it. And despite George Clooney and Catherine Zeta Jones doing their best to make it work. Did, at the beginning of the movie, we uh, in Intolerable Cruelty, uh, we see George Clooney getting his teeth whitened. And it seems like he's big into, you know, nice dental hygiene. Does that pay off in the movie at all? I think it's just supposed to show that he's a vain person and he cares about what he looks like. I mean, you can do that with, yeah, it doesn't pay off in the movie at all. I mean, you can do that with him looking in the mirror a lot and like fixing his hair, which he did a couple of times. Like I got that, but I mean, you, it's like with the lady killers. It's like, why are you setting something up? That's not going to pay off at all. It just doesn't pay off. Like it, like if you got a, a tooth knocked out and like that, you know, that was, that would mortify you if you, if you're big into dental, like that, do something like that, but it never, ever paid off. Um, but but to, uh, yeah. To answer your question about the man who wasn't there, it was not a popular movie, but it was received critically very well. I think it just kind of gets overshadowed because of their body of work and because of the year 2001 this is the year of fellowship of the ring and the first harry potter movie and then even in the independent yeah. films you had memento amelie Mulholland drive royal tenenbaums you had these other movies that were kind of getting more traction mm -hmm. so it kind of just got overshadowed but it's a beautifully shot film it's in black and white it's as noir as they've ever gotten. It's also maybe one of their weirder and stranger films. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, it was, yeah, 81% on Rotten Tomatoes is great. Um, box office budget was 20 million. And uh, I mean, uh, the, the budget was 20 million and it only grossed 18.9. So it was, yeah. But 81%, like you said, that's, that's really good for, I mean, a, a flop right yeah and i mean their movies aren't for everybody they are a acquired taste like even their best work i mean though most people i know love oh brother or art thou i haven't met too many people that say anything bad about that movie and even a lot of people like true grit you know those are probably their two most popular films you think it's more popular than fargo or the big lebowski well the big lebowski is a cult movie like it's in set definitely the cult status has grown extreme in the 20 plus years it's been out now so and fargo is popular but i think if you were to just ask someone on the street that's not maybe a movie person, they would probably prefer Oh Brother over Fargo. Hmm. Also because it's not as graphically violent or, you know, so I think Oh Brother is a little bit more of a crowd pleaser. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, well, it was really popular on the radio, at least. Yeah, I think the soundtrack's even more popular than the movie, and that probably plays to the movie's uh like ability is just how popular that soundtrack was and how that caught on like i believe it won album of the year at the grammys so dang yeah uh, um critical reception uh they got nominated for cinematography and best adapted screenplay for that mm-hmm uh yeah album of the year <laughs> yeah soundtrack oh my god album of the year that's at the grammys that's insane and they won best soundtrack and won album of the year and best soundtrack unbelievable that is insane and because it's country stuff 
It's bluegrass oh, and right? gospel bluegrass. music for the most part. Yeah. N never again. Yeah. Never again will that happen. A resurgence of bluegrass in the year 2000, apparently. I mean, inside you and Davis had some music acclaim too. Uh, yeah. But um, so so they 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 know what to do, and it's again that's like folk music right mm -hmm. it's not it, not mainstream so for them to be able to to do that is awesome you know what didn't happen in intolerable cruelty or the lady killers anything good <laughs> like no good music <laughs> i mean give us good music give us something to latch on to. yeah i can't remember did carter burwell do the score for both of these two Music by Carter Burwell for Intolerable Cruelty and music by Carter Burwell for Okay, Lady another great collaborator they work with. You can't tell he had anything to do with this movie either. Like you got Roger Deakins, you got Carter Burwell. Like everyone is on autopilot almost in both of these movies. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, more so in Lady Killers. I mean, just there's yeah, I think that one had a lot more to it than it, than what they brought. It could have been a lot better, but um, yeah, intolerable cruelty. I think I th they were going the route that they wanted to go, and I think you know it. It, it just didn't. It, it just it's not for us, right? Like it worked for my girlfriend, intolerable cruelty. Like she she thought it was great. There's no way she knew it was a Coen's Brothers movie, though. Like she she would have no clue. You know? Right. If you if she didn't see directed by Joel Cohen. If you said, oh, it's the same people that did Oh Brother, Where Art Thou and Fargo and No Country, she'd probably be like, no, it wasn't. Right? Yeah. No. Because they're, it's just, they're, it's so, so different. But, I, I mean, talking about it with you, it does, in looking at their filmography, it really, it, I, they put, they got, now they've done it all right just like we talked about a little bit before we need a war movie maybe but they seriously have done it all now and um but it doesn't mean that all of them are going to be good or work out because they went with like a a comedy within the lady killers it's not funny they went with the rom-com with intolerable cruelty it's not funny and the romance isn't even great but we just find them so attractive and we can see the sexual chemistry that that worked, but it's, you know, I mean, did you, did you want them to end up together in the end? I mean, I, I didn't, I didn't care, honestly. Cause I mean, it seemed like at first that like she wasn't as interested as he was. So I was like, how's, cause I couldn't remember how it played out. So I was like, how's this going to play out? Like, you know, like, where are they going with this? And so when they do get together, it just feels kind of like, I don't know why they got together. No. Yeah, and she's she's distracted with these other dudes. I mean, and, and out of all of them, Clooney is the most attractive, like, vying for her attention, so. And probably the nicest out of them, even though he's not, like, a good dude, but, you know. He's just yeah. an opportunist lawyer. It's not like he's completely evil. He's just really good at his job despite being dumb. Yeah. And don't you think in like Up in the Air, he's kind of playing a similar character, but does it so much better? Yeah. That's I mean, a way I mean, better like performance. He, yeah, absolutely. Like he he's he's screwing people over, but you feel bad that he has to do it. You know, like you feel it in here that he still kind of feels bad about doing it. But yeah, here it was just like he took that sort of character and then just made it into a sort of cartoony. It's it's also probably his worst performance out of the four films he's done with the Coens. Um, what's the... Fourth. We have Oh Brother, Intolerable Cruelty, Hail Caesar. Burn After Reading. He's in Burn After Reading? Yeah, he's uh he's a dumb like US Marshal 
type of guy who's sleeping with Tilda Swinton. Oh, right. Yeah, yeah. I remember just, yeah, Brad Pitt and Francis McDormand in that movie. Well, Brad Pitt does kind of steal the show in that movie by yeah. playing possibly the dumbest movie character ever. <laughs> um, but that movie worked. Yeah, well, theory. I have a theory that that movie is the Coen brothers making fun of, like, themselves and, like, their own movies in a way. Yeah, 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 I can see that. Especially when you have the two CIA guys being like, well, what did we learn? I, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, these are... There is one unique thing about the Lady Killers, though. It is the first time that they get shared credit as directors on screen. Mm. Prior to this, it always just said directed by Joel and produced by Ethan. Mm -hmm. And apparently it was some sort of DGA thing about having, you know, two directors credited for whatever reason. And I guess finally they were like, yeah, I guess we'll credit both of you as the directors since you are both directing Uh, yeah, that shows it here. Um, that's interesting, though. I never knew that. I did find it weird that they don't. They didn't credit them as, as two for so long. Um, yeah, and they do in No Country for Old Men. And yeah, from then on, it looks like. So that's so strange. I wonder how they were able to talk them into it. Like, why did it change? You know? Oh, I, I guess they had gotten enough clout and power to basically do whatever they wanted. They could finally get it. I mean, I mean, you know, they're like little critical. They've been critical darlings since the beginning of their career, but then they win can with Barton Fink. So that kind of anoints them as like, you know, oh, these are directors we need to watch out for, whatever they're doing next. You know, they have a flop with Hudsucker, but then Fargo, they get Academy Award nominations. So then they're anointed again. Uh, Big Lebowski is a flop when it first comes out. Critics weren't excited about that one, but it's become one of their most beloved films. Oh, Brother is probably still their most culturally popular film and then you know they just basically do what they want and i guess these two were them trying to stay in the business instead of retiring but i'm glad they got their groove back after these two movies and went on to make some pretty more impressive films that are up to their caliber of filmmaking because these two are not, but I mean, if you only have like two bad movies in a nearly 20 filmography, that's not too bad. That's still a pretty good record. Yeah. And not everyone would say that Intolerable Cruelty is a bad movie. I think they'd say Lady Killers maybe, but yeah, like my girlfriend appreciated it. So there's definitely some, some people that, w that would, um, I felt why cast uh, Richard Jenkins as Catherine Zeta-Jones' lawyer? You need him more. He needs to be in all of it, you know? Like, he's such a fantastic actor, and he's just thrown away in Intolerable Cruelty. Well, I mean, there's a lot of good actors thrown away in Intolerable Cruelty. I mean, in Richard Jenkins, uh, Jeffrey Rush is barely in the movie, and he's kind of just overacting. Yeah, but part. so then, yeah, then give Rich, Richard Jenkins a little bit of that. Let him have some fun overacting and, and be a part of, uh, you know, some whatever this is. <laughs> I don't really like Cedric the Entertainer's character in this movie at all. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I guess what's his face from Gilmore Girls is just playing the roles that he kind of played most of his career, kind of like rich, upper-class, white guy. Um, but mm -hmm. yeah, it's just... I mean, I guess if there's enough there, if you just like romantic comedies, it's good enough. But I don't know. I feel like 
something's missing and i think it's the cohen's passion or spirit or something missing from making this movie good for me because it should be good yeah like it's there but for me something's missing yeah yeah one of the main things about a director is to get the best performances that you can out of your actors and i just think that they were like just go just do do it do what you think it should be you know i don't feel like they gave them much direction because i think it would have been a little you know maybe they're a little too intimidated to tell tom hanks like a little less foghorn leghorn and a little bit more of you you know i, I don't know i i guess because i'm trying to think have they ever worked with a movie star of that caliber because i guess george clooney they've worked with but tom hanks has got to be the biggest movie star they've ever worked with right yeah i mean people can argue that uh nick cage is a bigger star you know i mean definitely in the 90s um but i mean it wouldn't be weird for and he's a weird performer anyway so it wouldn't be and especially at that point in his career he's not a huge star you yeah. know he's a well, no yeah actor. not then right exactly. so yeah i can't think of anybody else because they usually hire character actors for the most part mm -hmm. like yeah, they don't yeah. really cast big name actors they cast known actors but I, right but i don't think i've ever really because you know they haven't worked with like tom cruise or harrison ford or you know people that were huge movie stars back then meryl yeah may have worked with meryl street yeah i mean they do get big name like denzel washington for judging them that's true i forgot about denzel he's a movie star but that's their last movie you know so it took and them 20 movies to get there yeah so, yeah so yeah which much better performance out of him and Macbeth than tom hanks and the lady killers oh yes god duh. yes of course oh yeah. yeah um yeah these were interesting uh interesting films i'm i'm glad that i got to you know visit them and and uh see them through my eyes now um because um yeah they're just they're just regular fine movies nothing nothing to nothing to say much you know you can't say much about either you can nope. say a lot about how bad you know one is over the other but um yeah uh, it's it's tough two perfectly fine mid-2000 comedies that would probably otherwise be forgotten if they weren't directed by the cohen brothers oh yeah absolutely i mean it's like the movie, The Laws of Attraction. That's that's how people would think of of intolerable cruelty if it wasn't for the Coens. Yeah. Well, Justin, thank you for braving these two movies to watch <laughs> to discuss. Um, our last guest was like, "Well, actually, it's probably good that you did them together instead of doing two separate episodes on them." Um, yeah. You're going to be back to close this um, this series with us with the tragedy of Macbeth. Because awesome. I, I doubt that they will crank out another movie before we get to it. But uh, yeah, that should be the closer. Yeah, you have um, seven movies before then. So yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's going to be a fun run, though. I'm happy for you guys. I like us. I like a serious man a lot. I think that's a great film. Yeah, this is good. This is a much better run of films to watch than the Ridley Scott run because there's there's some stinkers in the Ridley Scott movies. Yeah, yeah. Uh, are you you're doing two directors at the same time right now, or are you just doing the one? Well, we're going back and forth. It just depends on people's availability on whose block of films we're covering each month. 
So, so uh, are you still a part of the the other one? Are you still yeah, we're the still other doing deck? Ridley Scott. In fact, we're going to be talking Hannibal in two weeks, and then we'll be talking No Country for Old Man in about three weeks. Oh, yeah. Um, um, I'll, I'm back on uh, the Ridley Scott one for the last duel, right? Yeah. 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 You'll, be, you'll be doing the last duel. Because we did the duelists. Yeah, that was that's pretty nice imagery there. It really is. Yeah. Well, uh, what do you got going on? What, are you reviewing the new movies for Worth of You? Yeah. Um. Uh, from today. Yeah. Are you the reviewing reasons? Elvis and Black Phone and uh, Marcel the Shell? Yeah. Well. Yeah. Uh, I don't know what we're gonna see tonight. We're definitely gonna go see one of them. Um, uh, I'm sure by the end of the weekend I'll have seen because I think Marcel the Shell is actually on on you can uh, VOD it as well at home. Oh so really? I think so. Um, I saw that it was on Vudu, and uh, you can rent it on Amazon. But um, I'm excited for that one. Yeah, it looks really good. I I have to say, I'm actually excited about it. Damn, a hundred percent on Rotten Tomatoes. Nice. Mm. Now that's a nice. Um, and I'm excited for yeah, Elvis. I'm excited for all of them. Um, last weekend was uh, it was a good for um, streaming movies. Uh, yeah, I watched uh, Cha Cha Real Smooth and hell yeah. Good Luck to You, Leo Gran, or whatever. I haven't seen that yet. Yeah, I haven't seen that one yet. Um, but Cha Cha Real Smooth is awesome. It's a charming movie. I really, it's a really sweet, nice movie. That guy is so good. The Charlie Day looking guy, he's so good. He was in a movie called Shit House. I haven't seen it, but uh, it came out like two years ago, and he wrote and directed it as well. I, th- I'm, I want to see it now because I thought he was so good. And yeah, charming in in Cha Cha Real Smooth. It was at, at the beginning of the movie. I didn't. I was like, well, ah, ah. but yeah, I, I it, it got me. It got me. Uh, have you seen Spider Head yet? I've not watched Spider Head yet. I've heard mixed things, but I hear Chris Hemsworth's really good in it. Well, I'll let you find out for yourself. I'm not a big Miles Teller fan, though. You don't like Whiplash? I love Whiplash, but uh, it's not because of Miles Teller. It's not because of Miles Teller. I mean, he's fine in the movie, but like, he's probably if the material's good, he's fine. If the material's not good, I don't think he's one of those. And I'm not trying to poop on Miles Teller. It's just me personally. I he's just not one of my favorite actors to watch. You didn't care for him in Maverick. He's fine. He's fine. I personally prefer uh, Glenn Powell's performance. I think he's doing a, a lot there. Yeah. yeah. But, I mean, he's fine as the the surrogate of, uh, you know, the rift between, you know, the whole Maverick and Goose stuff. And, yeah, he's fine. He's not bad. He's just, he's fine. But I did like Maverick. I uh, think it's actually... That- what oh you were saying something yeah I'll, I'll go back to it but maverick's your favorite what i think it's a much better movie than the original top gun oh i i i said that i agree actually somebody on youtube today was like i don't agree with you that it's better than the first but i do think it's really really good I'm like, okay well you probably grew up on that first one i mean this i mean i, I understand could... the nostalgia people have i'm not one of those people that has it and um mm. I think I think if you love the first movie, then you're gonna love the new one. Oh yeah, you it, it, it's it, it's the formula. But I teased um, and I was like, this one actually has a plot. <laughs> oh <ooh>, shit! <laughs> and um, I like the chemistry with him and Jennifer Conley, and I'm glad they I, have him paired with a woman like around his own age. <laughs> She was smoking hot in that movie. I, I've, she's always been like pretty, you know. But I was like, damn. Um, and I thought the Val Kilmer stuff was really touching. 
It was touching. I mean, it's it's super sad to see him that way, but I'm glad they still f- find ways to put him on screen, you know, because I'm sure if he wasn't going through what he's going through, he would be acting, you know, like regularly. So that's unfortunate. Um, I haven't seen it, but Miles Teller has done a boxing movie called Bleed for this. Have you heard yeah, about I heard about that. I never watched it. Yeah, Spectacular Now was one of the big ones that he did. Yeah, that's pretty good. Yeah. Um, Otherwise, yeah, Project X, he was in Footloose. Yeah, I would say Spectacular Uh, Now and Whiplash are his biggest movies. He did War Dogs. The Cowboy Kid, I guess, in the Footloose remake. He was the Chris Penn part. Right. Okay. Um, And then, of course, he was part of the... uh, disastrous fantastic four so yep i've never seen that mm, mm. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. um cool uh yeah there also last week that annette benning movie and brian cranston movie came out that's on hulu is that a then, movie i thought that was a tv yeah. show i thought so too but it's not it's a movie oh okay and well, then those are two good actors was, yeah, and Spiderhead, the Leo Gran movie, and Chachi Rose movie. Yeah. This week, besides the ones that are out in theaters, we have. Let's see here. Oh, Beavis and Butthead do the universe. That's right. That's on Paramount Plus. Uh, the Man from Toronto on Netflix. Yeah. With uh, Woody Harrelson and Kevin Hart. Okay. I don't know. Um, we have a movie called Rise on Disney that is about uh, the basketball player who I can't say his last name. It's so so hard and long. And then on Netflix is uh, Love and Gelato, which is a movie, a, a, a love story movie. But those are the, the other streaming movies. So, you know, they're doing 50-50. It's like a bunch out in theaters and then a bunch on home streaming. So... Um, I think it's helping, you know, and movies like Maverick, like I, when I wrote back to that lady, I was like, it was worth the two year wait because it was so awesome, you know, cause it was going to come out during pandemic. And I don't think it would have been as impactful if people didn't go see it in the theater. Well, that's what Tom Cruise said. I guess that's why we got to wait till next year to see mission impossible seven. Yeah. I mean, yeah, and he's doing a space movie right after that. So, I mean, we'll we'll see him, but it won't be as consistent as we have been. It's just, you know, every other couple of years now, I think we'll be seeing him instead of every year, which is which is sad because I like Tom Cruise. But um, all right, are you guys still doing the uh, the rating for the movies? Uh, do you want to rate these? I usually don't for the double feature, but um, I'm going to give these uh, they're funny looking, you know. <laughs> I, I don't think they're them. quite clusterfuck territory, but no. What, it's out of five? So there's a damn four. fine picture, which would be like the highest rating. Uh, quirky but delightful. So that's like your good rating. Deep dive. That could be any rating. You're just saying that it's probably more of an obscure or fan cult thing. And then funny looking, you know, is like, oh, it's mediocre. It's not quite that good. And then clusterfuck is it's a disaster. It's terrible. Yeah, I, I mean, Lady Killers is kind of in between the, the bottom two there because it is a cluster, fuck, you know, it's not, it's, yeah. Intolerable Cruelty is a little more tolerable. <laughs> so <laughs> that, That's um, a good way to put it. Um, yeah. <laughs> thanks for coming on. Sorry these weren't oh. better movies to watch, but I appreciate I you. Love, I love talking movies no matter what. And, uh, you know to watch yeah some ones that kind of i thought that i had seen and put in my bank because you know tom hanks big fan you know Catherine Zeta jones and george clooney especially in 2003 like huge 
should have been seen by me, but uh, yeah, I guess it just passed me, which is fine. Uh, movies will do that. I can't watch them all, even though I seriously try to watch and them all. You can't watch <laughs> them all, and I, you know what? If you're doing a Cohen rewatch with us, if you want to skip these two, perfectly fine. You're not going to miss anything from these, honestly. But Unless if you, you are want to see George Clooney and Catherine Zeta Jones at the peak of their hotness, then yeah. Um, unless you're a completionist, and then for sure check them out. So then you know how bad they are compared to their other movies. But yeah, we will be back in July with Hannibal for Ridley Scott, and then we'll get to the Oscar winning film No Country for Old Men. Uh, tomorrow we're continuing our with our brunch show for the summer of '82 with Rocky Three. Ooh, isn't that is that uh, Mr. T? That's the Mr. T one, yeah. A pity a fool. Yeah. Okay, but uh, thanks for coming on. Thanks for talking these aggressively mediocre films. But at least next time we have you, it's a better movie than these two. Um, because of the tragedy of Macbeth, tragedy of Macbeth and the Last Duel are both. Well, yeah, oh, are both exponentially yeah. better movies. Even though I know there are a lot of people that aren't crazy about the tragedy of Macbeth, I still think it's a pretty well done movie, in my opinion. Yeah, and I'll actually be glad to see it again after seeing it in theaters, and then. Yeah, I've already seen The Last Duel three times, and you we've already had a long discussion about it on the Fleming Film Show, but uh, I'm ready to have another long discussion about it, So, because <laughs> it was one of my favorite movies of last year. Uh, sweet. Yeah. Thanks for having me. Uh, anybody out there who's not following me or checking out my stuff on Network View, View Movies and all the things... Uh, yeah, we also do the Fem Fleming Film Show uh, with Rob Fleming. He's in London right now hanging out with Weezer and Green Day. So he'll be back. Uh, we'll be back next week. I think we're going to do um, the worst movies of 2022 so far and then follow it up with our favorite movies of 2022 thus far. Do oh. you even have a list? Do you have five and five right now? Could you even come up with five each, do you think? I don't know if my five worst would truly be the worst. They would just probably be the five I didn't care for because I actually haven't, since I haven't had to review everything, I kind of avoid the stuff that I think I'm not going to like. Mm -hmm. So I haven't really seen a horrible movie this year. I've seen a few like meh movies. So if I had a list of my five worst, they wouldn't really be bad they would just be like yeah meh these are meh movies yeah, <laughs> yeah. um before i i you know went through the list of movies i had seen to to put that on, i i only do disappointing movies like movie that i'm excited to see and then it just came out crap like the like these two would be on there um but uh then i looked through all the movies i've seen this year and i was like okay well i didn't really like that one i didn't really like that one but are they the worst movies of the year yeah, probably not but it's just you know, like this year is really tough because it's i don't even think i have five favorites yet i mean really uh, you know like it, i may but I know for a fact not a single one of them are going to be on my top five at the end of the year or even in my top mm -hmm. ten. Like nothing is clinging to me, to my skin yet, and I really want it to, and nothing is. I have at least four movies I'm interested to see if they will stay in my top ten at the end of the year because they, I have four movies I really, really liked so far this year. Can I hear a couple so I can see if we have any crossover? Oh, uh, one of them I know is not on there because you didn't like it at all. But uh, the the other ones are Everything, Everywhere, All at Once, uh, Triple R, and The Batman. Yeah, I have Triple R and The Batman on my list of favorites. Um, what was the one that I, didn't, that I didn't like? Turning Red. Oh. <laughs> yeah, no. Uh, there, there is one that actually will be on my top five and may be on my top ten at the end of the year. 
and it's Apollo Ten and a Half. I mean, that's a that's a charming, delightful film. I can't say anything bad about it. Yeah, that's the only one. I do have Batman on my list. I have, um, yeah, RRR, um, Unbearable Weight of Mass and Talent. I liked a lot. That was fun. Um, that was a fun movie. What was the first one you said? Everything, everywhere, all at once. <laughs> Yeah, oh, God, I just wish it hit me better, but it didn't. Um, yeah, we'll see. What about yeah? So for disappointing, the the number one movie that I was like, oh, this can't be bad, and it was really bad in my opinion was Dog. <gasps> you didn't like Dog? Mm -mm. Oh, I liked Dog. Also. Um, I mean, Father Firestarter wasn't that great. This I haven't <laughs> seen it because I heard it was bad. You know what's funny about that movie, though, is John Carpenter did the music. And he was supposed to direct the original Firestarter, but he got fired from it because of the thing being a huge financial flop. Hmm. Dang. That's kind of weird. Um, yeah. I didn't really like that Ryan Reynolds Netflix movie. The Adam Project. Oh, right. Yeah. See, I forgot about it. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I mean, I didn't like The Bubble. I know Robbie liked that movie, but I didn't care for that. And uh, that French movie that was on Netflix, too, which is usually a really good director, but I didn't like that movie. Big Bug, I think, is what it's called. Mm. Yeah. Big Bug. I'm trying to think. Uh, what else? Oh, Uncharted. I did not care for Uncharted. I fell asleep watching that. Mm -hmm. Can you tell you what happened in the last action sequence? I woke up and the ships were being rose up. Oh, yeah. Big Bug does not look good. No, it's I'm not. not. And normally, I like this director. Yeah, Jean-Pierre Genet. Yeah, he did Amelie. Yeah, he did Amelie. Yeah. Dang. Well, I guess. I mean, it's sort of like the bubble, where mm -hmm. you know you just have a good director who comes up with a crap movie. Kind of like what we yeah, talked about today. Maybe everybody didn't need to make a movie about their COVID frustrations. Yeah, and like I said about the bubble, I mean, I a COVID compliance officer on set. And it's li I, I, that's literally the life. Like, I don't need it to work to follow me home, right? So, yeah. Which is why I think also some people didn't like uh, Don't Look Up as well, because I think they felt like it was a little too soon for that type of humor. I think that's a much better made movie than The Bubble, but I can see why people didn't like it. Yeah. Well, Karen Gillan's so charming. She's great. I like watching her. And I mean, things. it's got a good cast. This should have been hilarious, but I just, it didn't work for me. Yeah. And there's a reason why I was out on Netflix only. Yeah, sometimes, sometimes you understand why movies go straight to streaming, even mm -hmm. though every once in a while they do some really darn good films. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. Well, hopefully they come out more. Please, more good movies come out because uh, I need I need a good top, top 10 list for the end of the year. Well, I mean, there's some ones coming out that might make it. I don't know. So it's only half the year so far. Yeah. But this time last year, I definitely, and some stuck around. I was, I was into it, but... Uh, yeah, maybe because the theaters are open more. Maybe it's just a different world, you know, like going to a theater and sitting there spending money on something, especially if you don't like it. We're at home. If you watch it and you don't like it, you're like, eh, at least I don't have to spend money on it, you know. So I don't know. There's a lot of different uh, feelings going on. The, the pandemic really, really hit us. So, And it's still going on. It's still happening. It's still happening. So... When you're out, wear your mask, guys. Sanitize and social distance.
Yes, please be considerate of other people because wearing a mask is not just for your protection. It's for the protection of everyone around you as well. And not yeah. only not just to prevent from getting COVID or spreading COVID, but any other sickness. If you yeah. notice the last two years, our flu rates were down. Why? Because a lot of people were wearing masks. So and it's sanitizing. Yeah. So it's not just COVID, even though that is still going on. And also, if you're vaccinated, you're not indestructible. You're not Superman. You could still get COVID. Yeah. And I see you guys licking your fingers still. You shouldn't be doing that. And then you're touching stuff. Plus, we have a good, you know, one of our movie friends, Allison, she just talked about how she went to a movie. And she was so disgusted by people not wearing masks and stuff and coughing and, you know. Yeah, and that's and in a, New York. This is not yeah. Texas where I live where they act like COVID doesn't exist. This is New York City. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and that affected her movie going experience. And it shouldn't be that way. So just wear your freaking mask. Be considerate of others. Like, if, if you need to cough, you cough in your, you know, like, do, don't just cough. Yeah, cover up like we always, always have been doing, you know, this is, I don't know why we need a pandemic to teach us something, but you're, you haven't learned, guys. So learn because it's, it's, it's making people who care about doing stuff like not want to go do stuff. And it, that can become depressing, you know, so, which is a whole slew of other stuff that people are dealing with nowadays. So um, just be considerate. No, that's all we have. Be considerate. Um, uh, watch us on YouTube, Facebook, Twitter. Let us know what you think of the movies and anything else we're covering. Just, you know, but be kind, respectful, and I don't want any racist or sexist or any no valid hatred. I don't want any hatred. Only, only opinions, and I don't want them if they're if they're any kind of hate. It's just talking about movies. I don't have time for that, and it'll it'll get taken off my page immediately. Yep, I also don't condone any of that. It's and what we just talked about is enough for us to go through. We don't need hate and disrespect, and you know, people out there trolling we don't need that and ultimately if you don't want to watch something don't watch it the, the when any television show or movie comes out you are not required to watch it you don't have to watch it and you can keep your opinions to yourself if you can't be nice yeah absolutely like it, we don't like everything like we just spent i didn't think we were going to talk 82 minutes about both of these movies which we didn't really talk about both these movies for 82 minutes but for a solid hour we did we, we but uh, a solid hour. we didn't like these movies but i don't think we said anything rude or disrespectful to the movies or the filmmakers or any of the actors involved mm -hmm. we just they, they just didn't work for us and mm -hmm. that's okay we're not going to like yeah. everything and yeah and we don't, I don't hate the Coen brothers or even Tom Hanks or George Clooney or Catherine Zeta Jones for any of this. I just dislike these movies and I'm still going to watch the other stuff that they do and create and make, you know, so it's, it's movies are in the eye of the beholder. It's, so it's speaking you. Speaking of that, what do you think of Catherine Zeta Jones playing Morticia Adams? Um, okay. So for me, like a, I went and saw um, Wicked in New York, okay? And it was the first time I've ever seen it. It's one of the biggest, best Broadway musicals ever. But I've heard Idina Menzel sing it, that song, Gravity, so many times that when I finally heard it live, it just didn't live up to the expectations. Now, this is the same thing. When you have the best Morticia there's ever been, and in my opinion, in the Adam Sandler, or Adam Sandler, Adam Sandler movies, like, that's a perfect role for her. I just want to see that. So Catherine Zeta-Jones may do a really good job, but the thing is, is you're not Idina Menzel, right? You're never going to give me the pipes that she did. So that's, that's where I'm at. I'm interested to see where it is. And of course, like I'm going to watch it, but there's just no way that you can do better. There's no way. 
Yeah, I, I I will be surprised if I actually like this Adams Family reboot. I think it's a show, not a movie. Yeah, it's a show. Tim but Burton. uh Tim Burton's involvement is kind of what is making me the most disinterested because I used to love Tim Burton, but I don't think he's made a good movie in a really long time. And I feel like he's just attaching himself to things people would think Tim Burton should make. Yeah. Uh, yeah, the last movie that we got from him was Dumbo. Which is I believe. okay. Yeah, it's fine. Yeah, but we did get Batman and Batman Returns from him, so uh, that, that's good. true. That was in his yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, cool. All yeah. right, Justin. Uh, are you excited for Catherine Zeta Jones? I didn't. I mean, I'm sure she'll be great. I I love Catherine Zeta Jones. I think she's a talented actor. I, I think there should be more of her on screen instead of just being Mrs. Michael Douglas, but. Yeah, I don't. I don't know. I'm sure she's got. I know they had a kid together, so I'm sure you know she's been doing things, and she doesn't have to work if she doesn't want to. But I, I would like to see more of her on TV or film. Last thing it says she was in was Cocaine Godmother. I don't even know what that is. Uh, it's a movie. Um, I guess she's a Cocaine Godmother. <laughs> okay. In, oh, in Miami, yeah. She, uh, dang. Mm, 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 mm. I mean, I don't know much about it. It's director is Guillermo Navarro. I've never heard of him. Mm. So, anyway, sweet. Well, yeah. Thanks for having me on. And um, yeah, get you back on my show. We'll do a, do a movie. Of course, you pick. And we'll yeah, do just it. Just let me know. Let me know, and I'll find something for us to watch. Well, why don't you start looking? And once you find something, just hit me up, and we'll we'll get moving on it. Okay. It's got to be something Sweet. neither one of us has seen, right? It's 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 better that way, yeah. Okay. And there's there's millions of movies out there, so like I try to get this one guy to to do it. And he's like, "You've seen everything," and blah, blah blah. It's like there's some like we did Memories of Murder last time, like. See, there's movies that I haven't seen. It doesn't have to necessarily even be international, but uh, I mean, just, yeah, like we can do, but I guess it's hard for, for two people to not see, you know, like if you want to talk about something and I haven't seen it or whatever, vice versa. But um, no, it's, it's more fun when uh, it's two movies that we can just go in blind and then talk about it blindly together. Okay. Yeah, I guess I'll... I guess I'll look for something and be like, hey, have you seen this? And then if not, we'll talk about it. Cool. Sounds good. Yeah, it's just something that you've even you really wanted to see or talk about. Because then it gives me like, like Memories of Murder, I've never, I still wouldn't have seen it. So I like, I like getting those, uh, those opportunities for, because I would never even think, you know, but uh, yeah. Sounds good. Uh, it's too bad we didn't get your other partners on here, but uh, yeah, if you uh, anybody out there watching who's not following these guys, you need to follow them. They put up, they put out content daily, and it's awesome because they'll put up movies like, "Oh, this came out on this date," and you're like, "Oh, no way!" And yeah, like, Chris is movie. really good at that. Even like bringing out movies I didn't even know existed. I'm like, "What is this movie?" Yeah. yeah. I guess he just searches and is like, what came out on today? So. Yeah, that's awesome. But that's I didn't know stuff. Batman and Honey, I Shrunk the Kids came out on the same day. That's wild. I love them both. Yeah, and I guess they both made a lot of money, so I guess it didn't hurt each other to mm -hmm. be released mm -hmm. at the same time. All Crazy. right. Well, enjoy your weekend. Let me know what you think of those movies, whichever one you see. I don't know if I'm going to end up seeing either of them this weekend. I might see one or the other. I really want to see Black Phone, though. So. 
Every, I don't everyone's see it saying this weekend. that. I'm going to see it next weekend, probably. Yeah. 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 I'll let you know for sure. All right. Well, take it easy and enjoy the rest of your weekend. And you thank too. you for Thanks coming for on, even if they My weren't pleasure. good movies. It was so great talking to you, no matter what. All right. Well, you have a good day and thank you so much. You got it, buddy. You too. See you guys later.